Hear then the written word of the Lord from the Old Testament, Exodus 12, 43 through 49. And Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, This is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it. But every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you've circumcised him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you, and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and one for the there shall be one law for the native and the stranger who sojourns among you. Psalm fifty sixteen. But to the wicked God says, What right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. For the New Testament, Matthew eighteen, fifteen through twenty. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen even to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you on, agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Matthew 22, 1 through 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned the city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready. But those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out to the wedding feast, uh, uh, went, went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. John twenty twenty one through 23 Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Verse 12. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen to 32. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was, when he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. And lastly, 2 Thessalonians three fourteen and 15. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So far the written word. We ask, O Lord our God, for your spirit to help us to understand the high value of the supper and also what it means that we are to guard the table and we are to encourage one another and lovingly rebuke and bring back a fallen brother. In all these things we pray for great wisdom as it is very tempting for man to be proud and boastful and fail to regard rightly your call. So we pray that you will lead us in a way of truth. Amen. Please be seated. Earlier when we were looking at the doctrine of the church, we considered that the church is defined not by its traditions, not by its antiquity, not by its power and prestige, but rather by three marks. First is the faithful preaching of the pure doctrine of the gospel. In other words, the church has a function nobody else has. As we've been told, if if we don't build hospitals, others may. If we don't build orphanages, others will. But if we don't preach the gospel, no one will. So the church's first and highest calling is preaching the pure doctrine of the gospel to the nations. Secondly, this gospel is accompanied with signs. Not signs and wonders the way that people would want with miracles, but rather with the sealing signs of the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And rightly practicing this requires giving it to those who deserve or should receive the signs and withholding it from others. And that for that led us to the third mark, which was church discipline. So we saw many of these passages when we looked at church discipline. Coming back now to the Lord's Supper, It's important for us to consider this in light of what is happening. God has given to us a kingdom that is growing. It is his kingdom. It will not be finally in its full estate until the day Christ returns and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. But until that time, the church is a part of that kingdom. It is where the kingdom gospel is proclaimed and where the doors of heaven are open for sinners and where believers are strengthened and encouraged in the way of truth. So the sign of entrance into the kingdom is baptism. And this is given to, obviously, converts, those who come from outside the church, but also children born into the covenant community are marked out because children are not random. In God's providence, he gives them to the families he gives them to. Our children, therefore, belong to God, and they are marked out as belonging to him. Baptism does not equal justification, but it is a testimony of the righteousness that comes by faith to those who believe. And while it is possible to receive the bare empty sign, we are, of course, more hopeful until we see someone reject these things. And so we are declaring God is gracious and generous, and he is incorporating many into his kingdom. And so we mark out children of believers as well as converts. Then, For those who are in the covenant community, the Lord, the the Lord would have us assured we belong to him. And therefore in the Lord's Supper, he is giving a testimony, a sign once again, I, I am with you. While it feels difficult and it seems like your task is overwhelming, it's not you doing it. You are merely instruments, vessels through whom I work. And so be bold and courageous. Speak the truth in love. 
I will make it effective. And here, here's a testimony. I really am with you. Here is my body. Here is my blood. So last week we were looking at what it meant to have Christ present. He's not physically with us. His body is human, limited like our humanity in one place at one time. But the person of Jesus is human and divine. And by his spirit, he is indeed present with us. So we have the real Jesus, but not bodily. And we do partake of the real flesh and blood of Christ, but not here locally, but by the power of the spirit, we are taken to heaven where we can feed on him. Now we need to understand what it means that therefore this is a sacred meal and not for everyone. So we will start from 1 Corinthians 5, 7. The Apostle Paul says, Jesus, the Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Well, what's the Passover lamb? Well, it goes back to the time of the Exodus when God is rescuing his people from Egypt. And the Passover lamb was the final, the tenth major sign he showed of his power, where the lamb was killed, his blood taken, put on the doorposts, and the avenging angel therefore spared everyone in that house. The firstborns were not put to death. And then the Passover lamb was eaten by those in the house, declaring that it is our union with this sacrifice that testifies to, of course, the final great sacrifice of Jesus Christ that has spared us the judgment coming upon the Egyptians. And now we are told that typology is fulfilled. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. So looking at the imagery of the Passover, then Exodus chapter 12, God tells Moses and Aaron that only those in the covenant community, circumcised Israelites may partake of the Lord's Supper. But then he says, any foreigner who understands that God is a gracious God of Israel and wishes to be identified with God and with Israel may receive the covenant sign, becoming part of the covenant community with all the obligations, and then they may partake of it also. Showing that God is more gracious than just being a God of Israel, but rather he does want there to be an understanding. It is a gracious God giving gift, but the people who receive this gift are now committed to a new relationship with him. We are in covenant. And so the foreigner, the slave, the sojourner, who wishes to partake must receive the covenant sign of circumcision and then he is bound by that same Mosaic law that the Israelites are bound by. So he can't say, oh, you know, I'm visiting. This would be great. Can I partake? The answer would be no. It's like, but if you do believe that God is the true God and he is gracious to save sinners and you want to be part of this, then you must receive the sign of circumcision and the obligations of the covenant that come with it. So that after the Passover, if you now travel back to your homeland, you're not freed from these obligations, but rather you are going to have to continue living under the Mosaic Code wherever you go. Otherwise, you brought a curse on yourself by simply wanting the external signs and not the reality. And that's why you see in Psalm 50, even to the Israelites, God rebukes them. To the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or to take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. So this warning goes out. If you have received the covenant sign of entrance and now you want the covenant sign of continuance, you cannot be presumptuous and arrogant. And as we just sang in Psalm 50, basically assuming God needs your service and you're doing a favor to God by being in church. No, God says, I've graciously brought you in. I'm the one doing the favor. I'm the one who is saying, I will take the covenant curses on my own head to see this covenant is fulfilled and you be blessed. But you, on the other hand, hate every warning I give you. Every time I tell you, turn back from your wicked ways, you reject me, casting my words behind you. Do you really think you're going to obtain a blessing from me just because you do the external trappings? And the answer is no. So we see the pattern then. To belong to the covenant means to be under its obligations in order to obtain its benefits. Now, God says, when you are unable to keep your required duties, I will take the curses on myself. 
but you are still to desire to hear my word and to be chastised and encouraged to grow in holiness of life. Otherwise, you hate discipline, cast my lips behind you. You have no right to claim you're part of the covenant because I'm going to exclude you. So we see in Matthew 18, Jesus says, it is a gracious thing to belong to my community of disciples. However, people are not yet glorified. Nobody is completely sanctified. So there will be sins. So when a brother sins, and here specifically against you, but even in general, you observe a sin, tell your brother his fault privately between you and him alone. And if he does listen, if he doesn't cast the words of God behind him, then you've gained your brother. So we see that Jesus expects there will be struggles to grow in holiness. And we are to encourage one another to do what is right. And if we are not stubborn, but humble and hear these warnings, good. We have been won back. We have obtained the benefits and none of the curses. But if we remain arrogant, stubborn, and we don't listen, the church is not to give up. But now bring two or three others along, or one or two others in order that it can be established. Your actions or your words are bad. You need to repent. If you do, you will be received back with joy. But if you do not, please be aware that it shows your arrogance because we're not just saying things according to our liking or customs. We are bringing to you the word of God. So if you're really ignoring God, you're casting God's words behind you. And God hates that. If he refuses to listen to the two or three witnesses, then take it to the whole church. This is when it becomes a matter of church discipline formally, where we suspend someone from the table, ask them to think seriously why we have brought these things against them. And if they say, I'm right, all of you are wrong. Well, then they don't belong to the church anymore. And then you see those words that terrify people and should rightly concern us. Verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And where two of you are gathered in my name and agree on anything, there I am among you and it will be done for you by my father in heaven. And you see the same idea in John chapter 20. Jesus says, I give you my spirit. He breathed on them, giving them his Holy Spirit and says, may there be peace between you and me. And now you have this power. If you forgive the sins of any, those sins will be forgiven those people. But if you withhold forgiveness from any, then forgiveness of sins is withheld. Now we have to understand the context of this. Jesus and God are not giving up their right to judgment to the church. God is judge alone. The church, on the other hand, when we have officers who desire to know the truth of God, study his word, and then they are speaking to the mind of God, they are revealing what is taking place in the heavenlies. So when the minister of God, under the care of the elders, having rightly understood the word, makes the declaration, your sins are forgiven, it is a heavenly word. And if you continue on in your sins and we tell you, you are not going to receive the elements from the table. It's not us as men being mean to you. We are trying to bring you the counsel of God. And we are telling you the actions you are taking are, re are revealing a heart condition that you are not desiring to know the mind of God and to do the will of God. And therefore, we want you to be aware of your separation from this gracious covenant and of the judgment that is awaiting you. You have no part of Christ, which is why we will not give you the bread and the wine. And so we are declaring a heavenly truth. This is why it's very important. You'll notice uh, our confessions are obviously, you know, we've laid out a number of things in the Ten Commandments summaries that we go through. In fact, we were looking at the Sixth Commandment today. We want you to see from where in Scripture we get our teaching and what we are binding you to, which is why, as a church, we do not bind you to a political party, to an economic policy, to a national identity, because all those things are beyond Scripture. 
And therefore, where we narrowly search out the word, say, this is what God wants from you, and you ignore us, you are ignoring God. So then we are on behalf of God saying, then you have no part of these things. So it's not us as men with power doing what we want and then God being obliged to follow us. It's us having known the mind of God, warning you if you are stubborn and comforting you if you are humble and contrite. Because it's got both ends to it. For the word of forgiveness to mean something, you have to know that we are bringing to you really the mind of God. And that's why we strive to know this word. So Jesus says outright, and you have both Matthew and John, this power is given to the church to make a declaration. So if you ignore it, you are excluding yourself from the church. And then we're simply making that declaration public at that point. Look at Matthew 22. Jesus, even in parable, speaks of the kingdom of heaven being a king who has a day of great joy. His son is getting married. He has a huge wedding feast planned. And there were many who were invited. But for whatever reason, they're not impressed with this king or they have other interests and they don't come. And he keeps sending servants to them over and over. It's like, one, you got the invitation. Now it's the day I'm sending you my servants. And then you ignore them. He sends another set. And then they ignore them. He sends yet another set. And they even kill some of them. At this point, the king says, now you don't belong anymore. Yes, originally you had been given the invitation. But now you don't want it? Fine, you are excluded. And so now the king sends out his servants to gather anybody they find. And then they found good and bad and brought them into the wedding hall. Now, the good and bad is in the plural, it's plural, more than one of each. But then when the king comes into the wedding hall and sees the guests, there's one, not many, one without a wedding garment. So invited guests would have been, of course, of a status that they can attend the king's wedding. However, when you go out to the highways and the byways and gather everybody, you're going to get people of all sorts including as the many homeless that you see out there on the streets. But they are being brought into the king's royal dining room. So the king opens up his wardrobe and he gives people clothes to wear. But this one man decided, I'm fine. And the king says, you cannot be in my presence unless you are dressed appropriately. And when this one refused to have the king's garments put on him... He was bound hand and foot and cast into the outer darkness. You can see Jesus is telling the church, I want you to know everybody who just shows up to church is not going to ultimately enter heaven. You need to take this warning seriously that you need to have my righteousness upon you. And if you believe in your pride, you don't need to heed my warnings and listen to my servants who are calling you back to repentance and holiness of life. You will be cast out. And in the discipline process, most people see that as kind of being, oh, that's tyrannical, that's cultish. No, it's a huge favor because we're warning you before the day of judgment so that hopefully you will hear and repent and be restored. Because remember, that's what Jesus says in Matthew 18. You have gained back your brother. And you see the same image in 2 Thessalonians 3.14 there. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Give to him a sign that it is not well. But when you do this, notice what he says. Don't do this regarding him as an enemy. You're doing this warning him as a brother. So even though his actions reflect something poor, we're still to have a charitable judgment. Yes, we remove them from the church as Gentiles and tax collectors, meaning you don't obtain the benefits of the Lord's Supper. We want you to know right now there's something about what you are saying and doing that we fear for your soul. But we're doing this because we want you restored, not because we want to show in pride that we are better than you. And then you see in 1 Corinthians 5 verses 12 and 13, the church is not to be self-righteously speaking of how those outside are evil. Those outside are outside. They're not our concern. God judges those outside. We need to be cognizant of our work in the church. Purge the evil person from among you. 
So we need to not be legalistic or self-righteous, but we need to still uphold the law of God as very good and warn people to repent of their sins when they're disobeying the law of God rather than casting the word behind you. So yes, this will be a difficult balance to strike because as soon as you start doing discipline, it's very possible to become self-righteous. But remember, that's not our goal. Our goal is to call people back to repentance. So we're not coming to you and saying, well, you're not as good as me. No, I'm a guilty and polluted sinner. I don't want to be the standard because that wouldn't do any good. However, nonetheless, in office, we have the power to at least speak truth to you in love. And so we want you to repent. And you see in 1 Corinthians 11, extended passage where Paul says, I fear for you because as a church, you are manifesting division. And he goes, well, division is to be expected, unfortunately, in an unglorified church because there are some who will believe and others who are hypocritical. So obviously the division will show because the genuine will be uh, separated. However, he says in the supper, you are all supposed to be admitting your guilty status apart from Christ. And all of us receive the same Christ. All of us obtain the same benefit. And therefore, all of us have the same union with Jesus, which is why we partake of identical bread and wine. And some of you are bringing feasts with you because you're going with the word supper and you are embarrassing others and leaving the poorer ones to feel excluded because the rich are eating well and even getting drunk while others have nothing. In all this, you are demonstrating you don't believe you are one in Christ, but rather you believe yourself more blessed because you're better and you have contempt for the other. But in this, you are not discerning the body, Christ being present with you and the church being the body of Christ. You are arrogant and therefore you're not really obtaining benefit from Jesus, but you're separating yourself from him. You are rather to be humbled by the knowledge that Jesus died for sinners Your only hope is to feed on Christ and be united with him just as the Jews were with the Passover lamb so that you will not have the avenging angel destroy you. Thereby, in receiving the supper, you are proclaiming and affirming Jesus' death on the cross is your only hope. So if you eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord arrogantly in an unworthy manner and without consideration to the needs of the other saints... You are guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. So examine yourself so that you do not eat and drink judgment on your own head. Actually heed the word when the law is read. Actually listen to fellow believers and especially when the elders come and speak to you and say, please stop saying or doing these things. Your attitude displays something unchristian. And we fear for your soul. And if you continue on and you are unable to receive this word, then we are going to announce to you, we fear that the spirit of God is not working in you. Because if he was, you would be humbled. Because we can show you where we're getting this word from. So understand how this works. We are to consider it indeed an incredible blessing to be invited to the wedding feast. But we have to recognize that we are not naturally worthy. We're not of the class and status that allows us free entrance into the royal dining hall. Rather, the servants must wash and prepare us, find for us royal robes to wear, teach us how to hold the cutlery, when to sit, when to stand and all that. And we are to respectfully hear this instruction or else we will insult the king and he will remove us from his royal palace. And so in that way, you see, discipline is of great value. But notice, we don't start by coming and yelling at everybody, oh, you're worthless. We speak in the general, as Paul does, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Know that you are one of those sinners, but know that Christ is given for you. So do you come with a joy-filled heart that you have been delivered, and therefore now you want to hear how to act in this palace which is not your natural home, but where you have been brought? Or will you continue on leaving as not just a pauper, but as a vile degenerate? 
and expect the king to receive you freely. <coughs> That's what's going on in discipline. So we must take seriously the power of the church in this, which is why we do have membership, which is why we don't give the Lord's Supper to each and every person, but rather to those whom we know who have professed faith. That's why the structure is there. And it is indeed of great benefit when used rightly. Let's pray. We ask, O Lord, our God, for your spirit to work in our hearts, to humble us, to realize that being warned, admonished, and rebuked are not insults, but rather actions of genuine love. Not that the people who do these things are perfectly loving, but you are lovingly working through them. And for us to ignore the men who speak is to ignore you when they show us from Scripture that the word spoken is indeed true. Humble our hearts to receive this instruction. Also give to us deep humility when we rebuke our believing brother or sister, that we not do so arrogantly, but with a desire to see their repentance and restoration. So we pray, O God, that the church would be strengthened as we work through these things, and you bless us in this way. Amen. Amen. So, beloved, let us continue then and sing the remainder of Psalm 50 and heed the warning that is given as well as the blessing that is promised. So let us stand and sing on page 13 the remainder. If I were hungry, would you know?